NASA has decided that Butch and Sonny will return with Crew-9 next February, uh, and that Starliner uh, will return uncrewed, and the specifics in the schedule will be discussed momentarily. Uh, I want you to know that Boeing has worked very hard with NASA to get the necessary data to make this decision. <clears throat> we want to further understand the root causes and understand the design improvements so that the Boeing Starliner will serve as an important part of our assured crew access to the ISS. I have just talked to the new Boeing CEO, Kelly Ortberg. Uh, I have expressed this to, the, to him. I told him uh, how well Boeing uh, worked with our team to come to this decision. And uh, he expressed to me uh, an intention that uh, they will continue to work the problems once Starliner is back safely and uh, that we will have our redundancy and our crewed access to the space station. Uh, this whole discussion, remember, is put in the context of we have had mistakes done in the past. We lost two space shuttles as a result of there not being a, a culture in which information could come forward. Uh, we have been very solicitous of all of our employees that if you have some objection, you come forward. Space flight is risky even at its safety, safest and even at its most routine. And a test flight by nature is neither safe nor routine. And so the decision to keep Butch and Sonny aboard the International Space Station and bring the Boeing Starliner home uncrewed is a result of a commitment to safety. Our core value is safety, and it is our North Star. And I'm grateful to NASA and to Boeing for their teams, for all the incredible and detailed work to get to this decision. You know, I'll start. I don't. I don't think it's a trust issue at all. I don't think we're we're rebuilding trust. I think we're looking at the data, and we view the data and the uncertainty that's there differently than Boeing does. It's not a matter of trust. It's our technical expertise and our experience that we have to to balance. And and I think Ken said it. We balance risk across everything, not just the Starliner piece. So I I don't see it as a trust issue at all. I guess counter that you. Well, I would say that um, we've had a lot of tense discussions, right, because the, the call was close, and so people have emotional uh, investment in, in either option, and, and that gives you a, a, a healthy discourse. Um, but after that, you have to do some work to, to keep your team together, right, to keep uh, your team uh, restored and ready for the next issue. And, and I'll acknowledge that we have some work to do there. Um, it, it's pretty natural whenever you've had a, a difficult decision to make. Um, but we're aware of it, and, and we'll work it. Uh, and we're committed to continuing to work with, with Boeing. Uh, Steve, any, anything you want to add? Yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily call it trust. I would call it a technical disagreement where we get uh, a group of engineers together and they disagree on the risk level of what could potentially happen to the thrusters. Um, Boeing did a great job building a model. Now, we, the question is, is that model good enough to predict performance for a crew? 
Um, all the work we've done is really important also for bringing this vehicle back. We want the vehicle to come back uncrewed. It needs to land at the White Sands uh, Space Harbor, which is where the opportunities are setting up in September. And all the work that we've done, both on the NASA and Boeing side, give us confidence to bring the vehicle back. It has to execute a deorbit burn. It has to do all the things we need it to do, undocking from the space station safely. So I think together we have worked toward that, that part. There's just a little disagreement in terms of the level of risk. And that's kind of where it got down to. And I would say, you know, it, it's close. It's very close. And it just depends on, you know, how you evaluate the risk. We did it a little differently with our crew than Boeing did. So. And Mark, uh, trust is a two-way street. And it's built uh, upon a relationship. And I think, uh, as indicated just an hour ago by the new CEO of Boeing, that they intend to move forward and fly Starliner in the future, which is very important to NASA, that we have two uh, human-rated vehicles. I think uh, you should understand the, the trust is two ways. So we're going to sit down with Boeing and kind of lay out what, what's that path, right? I, I would say the White Sands testing uh, did give us a surprise. Uh, we saw in that testing, as we did, you know, we did five total simulations with that thruster of a downhill uh, deorbit burn sequence. And so that's when we saw this swelling of the poppet on the oxidizer side. In other words, a piece of Teflon that swells up and it, it gets in the flow path and causes the oxidizer to not go into the thruster the way it needs to go into. And that's what caused the degradation in thrust. When we saw that, I think that's when things changed a bit for us in that now we know that's prevalent and where is it prevalent in other thrusters and then what could that swelling do in the future. So that's, I think, where we change course. What we have to do now moving forward uh, for uh, Starliner 1 is how do we avoid firing that thruster in a manner that would cause the heating that causes that oxidizer pop it Teflon piece to swell? Can we figure out how to do that with some testing? Um, and can we also, we also have learned recently that the environment in the doghouse, and I think I've talked about this, is hotter than we thought. In other words, there are, when the other thrusters fire in a doghouse, some of that heat soaks back into uh, an individual thruster and that causes the Teflon to swell, it also causes some vaporization of the propellant. So is there a way we can figure out how to get the doghouse cooler overall? And then thirdly, we see crosstalk when the, sometimes when an OMAC, the orbital maneuvering engine, the big 1500 pound thruster fires, it then causes heat on, on one of the adjacent thrusters. So we've got to sit down and go through all those details with Boeing, with Aerojet. Um, the teams have been so focused uh, over the last couple months at understanding uh, the, the physics and what's going on, which we have a much better understanding of that now. Now that we have that understanding of the physics, I think we can move forward and start to find mitigations for future flights. Yeah. See if Ken has anything to add. Well, um, for me, the, uh, the White Sands results I thought were a gift. It, it was just great to have that data. Um, and I really thought it might help us convert. Uh, I've seen it uh, with a few of our discussions where uh, we have people in different camps on a, on a risk decision. We gather more data and then a piece of data comes in and we, we come together and everybody agrees that uh, we, we take one path or the other. Uh, and I, I thought we might get there until probably about a, a week ago, I'd say. Uh, that, that's where it started looking like, hey, I, I just don't think we'll get there in time uh, for, uh, for bringing Starliner home in a, in a timely manner. Uh, with more time, we might have gotten a lot smarter, uh, but, but we're just at the point where we need to bring Starliner home, take all the data we can, and, and keep moving forward, I think. Um, so um, the, the, uh, the polling uh, was unanimous amongst all the NASA folks. Um, at Boeing expressed uh, the ability to either work crewed or uncrewed. Um, they believe in their vehicle and, and, and they'd be willing to bring a crew home on it. Um, we had some NASA folks that uh, took a broader view of the, um, 
of the the global risks who who thought that hey we probably should keep the crew on the uh, on the the test flight um, to, to say whether that was 15 20 percent of the people I'd, I'd have a hard time uh, coming up with that number but as far as the mood um, all of us really wanted to complete the the test flight with crew and I think uh, unanimously we're disappointed not to be able to do that um, but that's part of the reason our system is set up the way it is, right? You don't want that disappointment to weigh unhealthily in your decision. And so on purpose, our system increases the volume on some of our voices from the technical authorities, folks that are asked not to think about uh, those emotions. Uh, and, and it helps to pull you away from the fact that you might be disappointed in a certain decision uh, and then guide you towards that final outcome. And, and I would add on the mood in the room, you, you know, I think everybody is professional and did their jobs, but there is a, a sense of not accomplishing the mission that we set out to do. And even for myself personally, that, that is a hard thing to go through. It's a little bit of a, a situation of, of loss and feeling like uh, you lost something. And we haven't, in the ultimate long-term view, we have not lost anything because Boeing as the administrator Nelson said, is committed to uh, finding the solutions and flying Starliner again. But I probably can't express in words what it's like when you commit to a mission, you've worked on a mission so long, and then we make a fairly dramatic change, which, which we have not done um, in human spaceflight in a long time. And so there's a feeling of loss. Uh, and we'll work with our team to make sure we talk about that and we move forward from here because we need this team to focus uh, not only on returning Starliner safely, but we have uh, a Crew-8 uh, mission to return and reconfigure. We have a Crew-9 launch coming up as well, and we need to focus on all those things. We have a really busy time frame, and, and we'll do that. We'll talk to the team and, and make sure they understand that it's nobody's fault, and it's a normal feeling to have this feeling of, of loss or that you didn't complete what you uh, intended to do. 100% uh, because of what this uh, panel has already told you. Uh, the extensive cooperative working relationship between NASA and Boeing of uh, finding the problem but knowing that the uncertainties are what held up the crew getting on Starliner to go home and uh, a certainty on my part that we will find out the uncertainty and uh, Boeing's willingness to carry through on this program. Well, very much. Um, it has affected the decision today by this collective group and all of those that participated in the flight test readiness review this morning. Uh, it is a trying to turn around the culture that first led to the loss of Challenger and then led to the loss of Columbia, where obvious mistakes were not being brought forth. For example, uh, give you uh, specifics uh, going back to the loss of Challenger. Even the engineers in Utah in Morton Thiokol were begging their management not to launch because of the cold weather. And that information never got up. And that was happening on the very night before the launch the next morning. Another example, on Columbia, uh, astronauts would get through with their flights and they'd inspect the orbiter and they'd, as a matter of fact, uh, my commander, Hoot Gibson, said it, he'd, he'd look at subsequent flights and he would uh, look like that a shotgun had been shot on the delicate silicon tiles because of so much of the foam shedding off of the external tank. Uh, but uh, there was a culture that did not bring that information up to the decision makers. So NASA ever since 
has tried very hard to bring about an atmosphere in which people are encouraged to step forward and speak their mind. And I think uh, right today is a good example of that. I'll, I'll jump in on, on this one. Um, first off, all the astronauts on station are professionals. All those qualities I talked about with Butch and Sonny, that's exemplified in, in every astronaut that flies to the International Space Station. They're professionals. When they launch, they know that there are circumstances where they can be on board for up to a year. So mentally, you know, you know that you could be in that situation. Now, once you're in the arena, obviously, it's a little different. It's challenging. Um, you know, it's disappointing that, uh, that they're not coming home on Starliner, but that's okay. It's a test flight. That's what we do. They knew those risks going in, and, but we keep them very busy. There's a lot of science and research going on on the International Space Station that Dana can elaborate on and has elaborated on. Uh, we keep them busy. We keep them working, and they are continuing to pave the road for human exploration going forward. So it's great. They're part of the crew, um, and they're doing fine. I care deeply about their families. I know this is a huge impact um, to their families, and it means a lot. Um, their families are the pillars that keep them strong. They're the pillars that we at NASA depend on for the workforce to keep us going. Uh, they're the pillars that help this team uh, with the crewed flight test have the resilience to keep going, especially over these last two months that, that were needed to go forward, and that's both at NASA and Boeing. So family is the backbone of what we do in the support structure. So I tell their families, thank you. Um, thank you for their support. Thank you for the, what they do to allow NASA and our commercial partners to do what we do to explore space. To specifically answer your question, you remember when we started the commercial program, one of the advantages of the commercial program was that it was going to be a fixed price contract. Uh, so much of NASA's research and development on, in a very unforgiving environment space that is very hard and is cutting edge technology and it is very expensive. And as a result, on the normal way of contracting, cost plus, it will run the cost way up, not so with the commercial crew program. And that was part of the negotiation for both of the companies, Boeing and SpaceX, and they've got a, uh, a fixed price. And if you uh, check the record, you can find out how much uh, additional Boeing has had to, sp to spend. So uh, my answer, you're, you're posturing the question of what I would answer in front of a congressional committee about the cost, uh, is that this program is working like it should. Now, if your question portends something else, then speak it. But I think that's what you were getting at. Uh, Joey, uh, it did not come up, nor would it have been appropriate for in a conversation of which I'm alerting him as to what the decision of the flight test readiness review was that we would get into those matters. Yeah, yeah, we've we've started looking at the flight test objectives, what we have already accomplished on this flight, and what's remaining. We we, we have not, you know, made a total determination yet of what objectives are um, in front of us or or what we've fulfilled. We'll take a little time to do that. Um, you know, I I don't think we have decided on the path yet of uh, another uh, crewed flight test. We have gotten a lot out of this vehicle so far. It's been on orbit now for two and a half months, which we didn't intend, so we've got a lot of data out of that. We'll have to sit down and, and talk about the certification aspects uh, after the flight. It's a little premature to do that at this point. So. 
Yeah, we need to get the vehicle back on the ground and then analyze the data and be driven by that in our next decision. Uh, but I wouldn't rule anything out, right? I mean, there's we have we have options for how we move forward. Um, the one thing I, I do want to emphasize is we plan to work together with Boeing to find that path. Well, uh, so I'll, I'll kind of go through just mentally the, all the orgs we polled. Um, we unofficially uh, asked the opinion of the NASA Engineering, NASA Engineering and Safety Center, the Flight Operations Directorate, uh, the Division Director for ISS and uh, Commercial LEO Development uh, at uh, NASA Headquarters, the ISS program, the uh, Commercial Crew program, the uh, Engineering Technical Authority, uh, the uh, Crew Health and Medical Technical Authority, Safety and Mission Assurance Technical Authority, Authority. Um, let's see who else did I leave out? All the center directors yeah. from Stennis, Marshall, uh, JSC, JSC um, <clears throat> and Kennedy Space Center, where the commercial crew program is officially based. Um, anybody I missed on that list? I think you got just about everybody. Yeah, yeah. I think that I get everybody. And that was, and that was again, all, everybody concurred uh, with proceeding uncrewed. And they stated where they might have one or two people uh, during our meeting uh, that uh, that had a different opinion and tried to give those folks an opportunity to talk to the group. Uh, yeah, Mike, I think we, we uh, I, so I, let me go back to echo something Steve said. We've accomplished a lot on this mission and learned a lot about this vehicle, satisfied a lot of the objectives already. Um, that stressed here by Steve, stressed on previous press conferences. We, we'll look at this as we do any of our missions to see do, does it fall into the any of the categories that we have that we define uh, as a mishap once we get the vehicle back. Um, that, that's our time to look at that, so I think that's a question uh, I'd save and pose to us on the other side of, of getting the vehicle back. I, I can take a cut at that and we'll, we'll see. Um, uh, you know, when we looked at, first of all, we looked at the risk of uh, putting Butch and Sonny on the Starliner vehicle due to the issues with the thrusters that we've talked about. And so when we looked at that risk, we said that that risk was due to the uncertainties, due to the inability to predict with certainty that thruster performance for the rest of the mission, including holding the orientation of the vehicle for the deorbit burn and then maneuvering the vehicle for the separation of the crew module um, and the service module. When we came to that conclusion, we started looking at what other options Dana and I both did, what options do we have? because these missions are really jointly shared between the ISS program and commercial crew program. And as we started looking at various options, it was obvious to both of us that the easiest and best option was to uh, configure the Crew-9 vehicle uh, with a couple empty seats uh, on the way uphill to put ballast in those seats. Uh, SpaceX had that capability. Um, we also knew that we had um, a spacesuit on orbit already that we could utilized for one of the crew members. They've tried that on and that spacesuit works. Uh, both crew members tried on a spacesuit, so we have a, a spacesuit now we're gonna launch for one of the other crew members on crew nine. And then we really wanted to give the crew, you know, a, a suited return uh, like we always have in US space flight. So when we started to weigh all those options, it became very obvious that crew <coughs> nine was the best option, fly up two empty seats, have Butch and Sonny join uh, the increment crew and return on crew nine that just became the easiest, the best option, and the most efficient option for all of us. And I'll see if Dana has anything to add. Yeah, I would just add that, um, you know, knowing that this was a test flight, we made the decision a couple of years ago to uh, train and keep Butch and Sunny current with all aspects of station, some of the most complex things we do, spacewalks, robotics, some of the research. So um, we had them trained. They've obviously flown to station before. They've done long duration missions, both of them have. And so, again, when you line that up with our vehicle options and the fact that the Dragon spacecraft is highly automated, um, as you all know, we've used it for private astronaut missions. We do have a lot of experience taking uh, people with much less training than what our classic training is for our NASA crew and having them fly on Dragons. And so when you look at that in aggregate, it made a lot of sense to make the decision 
to adjust crew nine and have them do a full expedition and come home on a dragon. And, and one thing I'd like to add, um, a major goal of the commercial crew program is to develop <coughs> Um, not just the capability to go back and forth the space station, but a generic capability to go back and forth to low Earth orbit to develop a commercial capability. Um, there's two reasons for that. One is dissimilar redundancy. So you have this option where if there's a problem on one vehicle, um, you might not have the same problem on another vehicle. So, so you could use them uh, for a return or, or, or perhaps keep them flying while another vehicle is working through um, recovery from some sort of a problem. Um, but it's also to provide some competition. Uh, in the environment, uh, and, and competition is healthy in a lot of ways. It uh, causes you to develop your technology. It causes you to get better pricing, uh, and, and we would like to have that competition in the future. Uh, so that's, that's why we have more than one provider we're trying to develop. On Sierra, uh, I will let somebody else uh, answer that. Uh, with regard to Boeing, uh, remember, it's a fixed price contract. Uh, we expect delivery on the contract. And therefore, uh, there is no discussion at this point uh, on NASA's part uh, in the question that you pose, which is basically that they've spent X, will they spend Y to get to where uh, Boeing Starliner becomes a regular part of our crew rotation. That's not, uh, I don't have the answer to that, nor do I think we w would have the answer now. And I'll, I'll add about Sierra Space. Um, Sierra's working very hard on their first maiden voyage of the Dream Chaser. That's a cargo mission. Um, they've got the vehicle down at Kennedy and they're working through test and final assembly. So it's, it's the plan that they fly cargo missions to station through the rest of station. And in fact, that's the scope of the contract that we have with them to provide cargo capabilities. There is no existing contract with the agency for crude capability, which doesn't mean that that's not a possibility somewhere in the future. And in fact, Sierra has their own goals about moving in that direction in the future. But for now, the work and the focus is on getting them flying as a, as a cargo flight. And if you look back to how we started um, SpaceX and the Dragons, that's a very similar approach. We started with cargo flights first, we flew a number of flights, and then they eventually evolved into the uh, crewed version of the Dragon. Sure, our focus with all the uh, international partners, as you can imagine, um, discussions about what's happening on board or changing launches or operations on board involve not just our NASA team, but the entire international partnership. And so similar to the discussions you've heard today, the focus has been on the decision immediately in front of us with what to do with Starliner crewed or uncrewed. And in fact, when we ended the uh, review today, I sent an email out to all of the, the program managers across the international partnership so they understood the, the decision. So they've been following along with us. Um, in terms of Roscosmos thinking about um, our integrated crew exchanges, and flying on the, the Boeing vehicle, they have always maintained that they want to see a few successful flights before they fly crew on it. I don't expect that that'll change, but we're not, we're not actively having those discussions right now. Right now we're focused on what to do with Starliner, but of course those are things we'll talk about in the future. Yeah, good, good questions, Irene. Uh, what I would say is, the, the thrusters uh, on this flight relative to orbit flight test two have experienced higher heating. We had more thrusters fail off, more thrusters um, see degradation. In fact, you know, one of them uh, failed off and we haven't hot fired that. We did two docked hot fires at ISS and we've chosen not to utilize that thruster at all. But they've experienced a little more stress, I would say, than the previous flight. Even though the deorbit burn was successful on OFT, uh, the first orbit flight test and the second one, these thrusters have experienced more stress, more heating, and so there's there's a little bit more concern for how they would perform during the deorbit burn, holding the orientation of the vehicle, and then also the maneuvers required after that. We've also learned uh, in the starboard doghouse in particular, there is 
extra heating that we have just discovered in the last two weeks and looking at the data a little more closely, anytime an orbital maneuvering thruster fires in that doghouse, uh, there's, there's higher heating. And so we had one thruster on OFT2 uh, in 2022 fail off after the deorbit burn. Um, we, it would not surprise me to see uh, one of the starboard uh, aft thrusters in that doghouse fail off in the deorbit burn for this flight. So I would say a little higher heating, a little bit more thermal, and a little more uncertainty now that we understand the physics a little bit better for crew return. Um, in terms of the preps of the vehicle, um, you know, we've been getting uh, the vehicle prepared. Um, the team is on the ground, really has gone through and looked at um, uh, the flight software that's, that's on board. Is there any changes that need to be made to mission data loads? Uh, this technique of using a, a very simplified SEP sequence has minimized the changes required on mission data loads. Uh, they are going to take the actual software that we plan to use and, and put it through its paces in, um, in the uh, facility that's a hardware software integration facility that Boeing has. The team has been doing um, practice runs uh, in a training facility. When I say the team, the ground team has been doing runs just to make sure they understand the differences between the uh, uncrewed and uncrewed. And, and really, I think it's, um, I would say, uh, unconnecting muscle memory almost. If you've been training for two years to do things a certain way with the flight control team on the ground, with the crew on board, where you can make calls to the crew to do certain actions, they now have to take those actions. And so they've been doing those practices. And there's an integrated simulation next week on Wednesday with the ISS flight control team. The undock sequence is always a, an orchestrated a series of events between how ISS gets configured, uh, how we depress the interface between Starliner and the ISS, how we configure the, the guidance navigation control for the space station and the software. And so they're gonna do that integrated practice next Wednesday. And we'll take our time. If that goes well, you know, we'll, we'll pick an undock date. And if it doesn't, we need more simulations. We'll, we'll go ahead and pivot. We've laid out a schedule that allows us the opportunity to, to have some flexibility in Starliner undock. And that's been very important for Dana and I. Um, if you look at it, we knew going in that the um, crude flight test uh, was probably a little higher risk than a uh, typical uh, rotation with, uh, with Dragon uh, where we've flown multiple flights. Um, that's why we called it a flight test, right? Um, uh, we had the issues coming uphill and, and that raised our risk level and our uncertainty in how much more risk there was. Um, anytime you change from your nominal plan that you've spent uh, years developing, you increase risk on the other side. And the type of risks I'm talking about are uh, that um, uh, something that we've uh, analyzed for contingency return with the crew uh, on the on the mid deck of the Dragon, or um, the the. Um, necessity of sending up new suits where the crews weren't able to try out the, the pressure suits on the ground so that they would have suits on the Dragon. Uh, those types of things raise your, your risk a little bit on that side. And so now both of your risk levels have gone up uh, and you knew going in that one was a little bit higher and you've got uncertainty on just where it fits. So, so you have to really dig in to understand um, what the, the baseline risk change is. And that's what the team has been working so hard this last couple of months. Um, for me, one of the really important factors is that we just don't know how much we can use the thrusters on the way back home before we encounter a problem because of the heating effects that happened on the way uphill. But Steve can tell you a lot more. No, th thanks, Ken. Yeah, I'll just mention a couple things. Uh, one, we had uh, some thruster experts come in and, and talk to us a few weeks ago, and, and we are clearly operating this thruster uh, at a higher temperature at times than it was designed for. I think that was a factor that, as we started to look at the data a little bit more carefully, um, we we're operating the thruster outside of where it should be operated in. Um, understanding could we have, could a thruster just fail off gracefully or could there be another failure mode that is not so graceful? I think that was an important factor as we talked about the two differences. Um, I mentioned the starboard uh, doghouse and so for some reason the heating is higher in that starboard doghouse that we 
We do not understand when an OMAC thruster fires, the other thrusters get heated at a much higher rate than we expected. Um, we, don't, we don't have a closed loop model to predict the performance. We, we tried, we worked very hard of trying to anchor a model based on what we saw at White Sands and then knowing what you had in the uphill phase, knowing that you have a model that can replicate what we saw, can you predict the downhill? We really just couldn't get there uh, over the last number of weeks. Um, also, how close we were to a, to a cliff. In other words, we've damaged the Teflon on some thrusters. So when we start to fire them again, will that damage repeat uh, or get back to a point where now the thrusters are at the levels we saw uh, on, the, on the docking day very quickly? And then really it's the consequences of failure. When we started thinking about um, the kind of failures we might get, uh, we had those on docking day, and those were in a, even though we were 200 meters from station, it's a very benign environment. This sequence, when the Dilbert burn has to execute and then you get into the SEP sequence, it's a very rapid sequence from the completion of the burn to then getting into the separation a number of minutes later, and there's no real time to reconfigure. So when we laid it all out, that's where the preponderance of, of the risk was to not put a crew on the vehicle. Let's see, for the first, first part of your question, um, just at a high level from a, a programmatic standpoint, we protect for about four months of what we call consumables reserves, so food, water, um, different kinds of consumables we have on board. Those are, those are the two biggies. Um, four months for four crew is what we protect for, so we always stay above that amount. And we do that intentionally so that if we had a problem with the delivery, a cargo flight that didn't make it, for example, we'd have margin. Um, so we always have a little more than, than what we need for some period of time. It's not limitless. In this particular case, we did have a resupply mission. In fact, just a few weeks ago, the Northrop Grumman 21 flight came up, so we had our eye on that flight. And so once we realized the team was working through issues and we were likely to have Butch and Sonny on board, we changed that flight's manifest, so we added more supplies to keep us above that reserve um, level. Uh, we've also got the SpaceX 31 cargo flight coming up around the corner, so we've got extra supplies on that. And so we've been able to modify and adjust um, our cargo mission supplies to accommodate uh, the extra the extra mouths we're feeding. No one has had to go on a diet or calorie restrictions, um, so we haven't had any limitations there. In terms of duration on board, you know, you ask an interesting question. One of the things as an agency that's really important for us is to understand the impacts of long duration space flight on the crew. And so, so far our experience base and that of um, a cosmonaut experience base is up to about 12 months, uh, give or take. And so we understand very well uh, performance implications and what it looks like for operations and, and crew health there. So you're asking the question about how long is too long. I don't think we as an agency know the answer to that. We can tell you that we understand what 12 months does. We're interested in that for Moon to Mars. And those are some of our research objectives and what we're trying to learn in the microgravity environment, but no specific concerns with eight months or, or even up to a year. And so far, data suggests that as long as we've got the right mitigations on board, exercise, you know, the crew spends about two and a half hours a day with cardio and, and weightlifting, and as long as we can keep them um, in shape with rigorous routines, et cetera, uh, we've done a pretty good job keeping the uh, crew's health up with long duration stay. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the question. I, yeah, I think if we look back at OFT2 now with this newer lens of what we learned at White Sands, uh, cer certainly could we have explored OFT2 in a little more detail, either uh, leading to some redesign of the doghouse to get the thermal environment lower or operate the thrusters differently. I think it's, it's easy to do that in hindsight. You know, if we went back and, and thought about the, the whole integrated problem a little bit more, uh, could we have done some kind of testing? What what I would say is it's it's very difficult to test uh, the doghouse environment on the ground. Uh, you've got thrusters that fire in multiple directions, and it's very hard on the ground to have a, a test facility, a vacuum chamber that accommodates thruster firings in multiple directions. So, and then get the thermal right uh, in that doghouse and keep the thermal up. So. There was no easy way to do that test on the ground. We 
thought, obviously, we had done enough analysis to show that the thrusters would be within the, the temperatures that they were qualified for. Clearly, there were some misses back in qualification. We're going to go through that data in more detail uh, uh, post-flight and then figure out what we can do to go fix them. And then we'll also look at our process. I would say we're going to look at the certification process. I know Boeing's looking at their process as well on how they got here. We're doing the same thing on the NASA side. Yeah, I, I, I can answer the question. So normally we would back away from the space station, um, essentially go uh, out in front and then above the space station, and then eventually end up below the space station and then on a trajectory that, that goes beneath it and out in front of the space station. That was our normal, normal plan to undock, um, uh, heading into the flight before the flight. Now what we're going to do is execute a, a small number. The, the undocking itself with the NASA docking system will be exactly the same. We'll use the same uh, techniques. The software will command undocking. We'll drive a sequence of hooks. They'll open up after we've uh, depressurized that area in between uh, the vehicles, and then we'll, we'll undock. And there's some springs that push the vehicle away. Uh, what we'll do is we'll go through a a SEP sequence that puts us on, I would say, what's called a, a pause grade trajectory. And so we'll end up going, essentially phasing out behind the space station to a safe distance, and then we'll get away from the space station and execute the deorbit burn. So we've used that kind of SEP sequence in the past in other vehicles. <coughs> uh, we've tested this SEP sequence. It is already in the software. It's, it's one of the breakout sequences that are already in the software. And so what we'll do is just go command that sequence early uh, and use that to get away more quickly. Um, and so it, it's, it's pretty simple, pretty elegant. It was a great idea by the Boeing team. So let me start with the first question. I think um, the, Steve was talking about how we process the data. I was talking about being encouraged by the fact that we had new data. Anytime you have new data, it means that you can analyze it and find out that, that things are um, um, proceeding uh, well and, and you can converge the team with that new data. What Steve found was maybe a little bit different and that's why it probably sounded different um, how we reacted. Yeah, I would say at, at White Sands, we, we were excited, and that was really a turning point in that we were able to replicate uh, the loss of thrust. Uh, we simulated the, the uphill profile, in other words, how the thrusters fired from the launch sequence and on orbit all the way to docking. We did two of those uphill sequences, and then we did a number of downhills. And so we were encouraged when we saw that we could actually see thrust degradation in those downhill runs. What then was new is once we took the thruster apart and we looked at the, the valve on the oxide, oxidizer side, we saw this swelling um, on the Teflon seat, which uh, when we talked to the, the vendor, Aerojet Rocketdyne, they had never seen this before in this particular thruster. And so I think that's where there was a change in the risk posture. Initially, we were somewhat excited by replicating the damage, but or the degradation in the thrust, but then when we looked a little more closely, we saw this swelling on the Teflon, and then that gave us a whole new uh, idea of the physics involved in the failure mode, and then that led us to study <coughs> that failure mode a lot more in the last few weeks. Um, relative to the four-person Starliner crew, uh, you know, we haven't really had those discussions yet. We need to get the vehicle back. We need to work through our, our sequence of events on what changes we'll make, both for the helium leaks and the thrusters, and then we'll make a decision on the next flight. It's a little premature to discuss that. For the obvious reason that, number one, we need two spacecraft to uh, have the redundancy in case one is not available to take crew to and from the International Space Station. Number two, this is according to a arm's length contract and a contract that is a fixed price contract. And number three, Boeing has been a great partner for NASA over the years. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the big uh, Space Launch System, the SLS rocket, is overall managed by Boeing. 
and there has been a long history with Boeing. Uh, the fourth reason is that they were the successful bidder along with um, uh, SpaceX because we had wanted to. So for all those reasons, that's why NASA does business with Boeing. So I'd also like to add, Boeing operates the space station for us as well as the prime contractor for space station, and that's in its 25th year. So um, we have a, a long and storied history with them there also. Yeah, Boeing's been a great partner with us on space station, and, and, and I think the key word is partner. A lot of people want to focus on the contractual relationship where we're buying something from a company. This isn't completely like that, right? I mean, we have a contract with Boeing, but it's to work together to develop this capability for our country. Um, and, and, and we've had two good partners, Boeing and SpaceX, when it comes to commercial crew. And w when they have problems, we don't just uh, throw rocks at them or tell them that we don't like them. We work with them to get through those problems. Well, I'll take the first part, and it looks like Jim's getting ready right. to take the second part. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but uh, the, the reason Boeing's not here is, is, is it was a NASA decision today, crude, uncrewed. That was the focus of this review, and so we thought it was reasonable to have just NASA on this panel. Jim, anything you want to add? I, I think uh, that's correct, Ken, and then I'd add, I think Ken and Steve have characterized that Boeing was part of the decision process. They've characterized what Boeing's position uh, was so uh, that and and we're here to communicate the overall NASA position. Bill, if anyone knows, you know that NASA is not only bipartisan; it is nonpartisan, uh, and that's the way we've tried to operate uh, this agency as long as I've been here. Uh, I can tell you unequivocally, from a personal standpoint, uh, that politics has not played any part in this decision. What I said earlier uh, about Challenger and Columbia and the lessons learned and what we've tried to change in a culture in order that safety is our nor North Star. Uh, is what we are trying to do uh, in a very hostile environment in which you, if you make a mistake, it's very unforgiving. So I can tell you unequivocally, uh, I have seen some speculation in the press that uh, because we are in an election season, that decisions may have been made with regard to uh, this announced today with regard to an election. Absolutely has nothing to do with it. And as long as I'm around here, it's not going to.